All right. So we spent last class getting an understand, uh, developing an understanding of how transcription works uh, across prokaryotes and eukaryotes. And today we'll talk about how that entire process can be tightly regulated. And we'll be talking about this in the context of uh, diabetes and anabolic steroids. So typically, whenever we talk about gene expression, we are typically describing the uh, transcription of a specific gene, as well as the subsequent protein production. And usually, uh, oftentimes, that, uh, the, the, a lot of that control can be happening primarily at the transcriptional level. Um, when we talked about MODI, well, one of the forms of type 2 diabetes, uh, we, we, I, we tried to briefly, I tried to briefly mention how it's uh, transcriptionally uh, defective uh, with respect to insulin. And it's not necessarily the machinery of transcription that's defective, but rather the regulatory mechanisms that control transcription. And so there's a, a defect in the regulatory mechanisms there. And the way anabolic steroids work is that they actually act on modifying gene regulation. And so we're, we're going to be talking about those at the end, uh, but before that, we'll be trying to get a sense of how these things work. For anabolic steroids, uh, as many of you know, there are a lot of, while there are very clear benefits to anabolic steroid use, there is a laundry list of symptoms uh, or consequences that occur as a result of it. And so there's far too many for us to go into detail here, but why athletes use them uh, is large, can largely be attributed to increased muscle mass, strength, decreased recovery time, uh, and also, uh, depending on the sport, increased aggression as a benefit. And so these are, these are instances where for a comp they provide a competitive advantage for athletes, but there's also a therapeutic benefit to them as well. Um, and so there are instances in different patients, depending on their disease state, where either anabolic steroids or the downstream uh, genes that are regulated as a result of their use can actually be therapeutic in some cases. So we're first going to try and take a look at gene regulation in the context of prokaryotes. And then uh, with that with that understanding of a, of a simpler regulatory process, we'll then take it and uh, expand it a little bit in, in us and in eukaryotes. So lactose is a, uh, for back, lack of a better phrase, it's a, a milk sugar, if you will. Uh, and typically lactose is, uh, is a energy source that bacteria can use in the absence of glucose. And so what ends up happening is that uh, lactose is, we talked about transporters and how they can shuttle different micromolecules or biomolecules in, intracellularly into a cell. And so for lactose, the, sh uh, the transporter that shuttles it into the cell across the plasma membrane is called galactoside permease. And so galactoside permease can shuttle lactose in and in an effort to use it as a substrate for energy for metabolism, there's an enzyme called beta-galactosidase that actually breaks it down into glucose and galactose. And there are other enzymes that can actually take galactose and turn that into, into glucose. And so in a, in a deficient environment, in an environment deficient of glucose, lactose can actually become, lactose can actually become a substrate for energy. But what's important to note is that the transporter uh, and the enzyme, galactosidopermease and beta-galactosidase, they are not always going to be uh, largely expressed because again, this is in the case where there's not much glucose. And so there, it's not energetically favorable to be constantly expressing these, uh, this enzyme and this transporter protein. And so there's, uh, this is a situation where there uh, is a regulatory mechanism whereby the expression of uh, the enzyme and the shuttler is only expressed if lactose is not present in the environment. And so this is actually what we're gonna do is we're gonna, uh, we're gonna, under, we're gonna try to understand the segments of uh, the gene model in prokaryotes, and then use that lactose model to try and under, the lactose ex, uh, ex, environment to understand how this gene is regulated. So 
as we, this was briefly mentioned uh, in response to a question last class, but uh, in prokaryotes, there are oftentimes genes that exist in tandem within a single transcription unit. And that's usually referred to as poly, being polycystronic, when there are multiple, uh, multiple genes that encode for a, a protein or a polypeptide that exists within one transcription unit. And in the instance where those sets of genes within that same transcription unit have related functions with one another, uh, and that they can actually regulate one another, th that's actually referred to as an operon. And so uh, using the lactose example here, what we have is a, the LAC or lactose operon, where LAC, the LAC-Z gene encodes for the enzyme beta-galactosidase. Uh, LAC-Y encodes for galactoside permease, the, uh, the shuttler, uh, what brings in lactose into the, into the cell. Uh, and LAC-A uh, encodes for a different uh, enzyme, transacetylase. Uh, we're not gonna focus on that here, but the, uh, the, the main takeaway here is that in the operon model, that a, a related set of genes that work together uh, and that are within the same transcription unit, that's what we refer to as an operon. And when there's multiple genes within a single transcription unit that encode for different polypeptides or different proteins, that's referred to as being polycystronic. And so the, in, the, in the operon model, uh, typically what an operon can consist of is uh, one of them being structural genes. What we refer to, what, structural genes are usually genes that encode for uh, enzymes or proteins of interest that actually carry out the function or various functions related, that are related together. And so um, we, here we have beta, the LAC-Z and LAC-Y gene that encode for the enzyme and for the transporter, beta-galactosidase and galactoside permease. Those are structural genes that are related to the LAC operon here. We also have uh, regulatory genes. These can actually contribute to the uh, controlling or the regulation of the expression of these, stru of these structural genes. And these are typically expressed by, uh, these typically express regulatory proteins. And so one example of that, that we're gonna talk about is uh, a regulatory gene that lies upstream of the LAC operon. So one of the segments uh, that exists adjacent to the promoter is something called an operator. I, uh, actually, I'll stop here. Are there any questions before I move forward here? Typically, structural genes lay within uh, the, la the operon. They have, they share, the, structural genes share the same promoter uh, and the same terminator, but regulatory genes do not always exist within that operon but are related to uh, regulating the expression of what's within that operon. Do you have a question up front here? Oh, I was just gonna ask what you just said, you know, like <clears throat> in this example, the regulatory gene is not staying with a particular operon, but that's near it. Yeah, so and- So that's like another way that an operon could be structured. Yeah, and so typically uh, while the regulatory gene is not within the operon, the protein, the regulatory protein that, that is created uh, in response to that regulatory gene will act on the operon. Liam, go ahead. So since the operon, uh, the two creating the regulatory protein, it's your, uh, the, the first uh, possibility that you described, the, you, typically in the operon, they all work in concert together towards some final goal. And so in this case, uh, in this case for the LAC operon, these different segments, these different genes within this operon all work towards the function of using lactose as an energy substrate to create glucose and create ATP. Yes. I just thought of another question. Um, so for this example, the lack operon, does it, um, does it only operate, okay, so I know it only operates when lactose is in the environment, but if glucose is also in the environment, does it not work 
like does it not express itself? That's an excellent question. And I think I'm gonna get to that for your slide. So hold up. So the question uh, for everyone, if, for those in here, how, if this is for lactose as an energy substrate, what happens when glucose is present? We're gonna get there in several slides. So adjacent to the promoter within an operon is a segment of the DNA called the operator. Uh, it, is a, it is a part of the operon that sits between the promoter and the first structural gene. And what's really important about the operator is that it is a site of regulation for the rest of the operon. Uh, and so typically what will end up happening is that we have these regulatory genes that are not part of this operon, but the regulatory gene encodes for a regulatory protein that will then come over and act on this operon. The site at which it acts is the operator. So I'm gonna try and say that again, just because uh, there's a lot of moving pieces here. So again, we have our structural genes and regulatory genes. Structural genes are the parts of the operon that encode for uh, specific proteins or enzymes that help carry out an effector function that participates in this ultimate goal of what this operon is responsible for. Regulatory genes are, are not part of the operon. They don't share the same promoter. They're, uh, they, might just let, they might just lie, they might just lie upstream from the operon. And in this case, that's how we draw, uh, we've depicted this regulatory gene here. This regulatory gene will encode for a protein. In this case, it's uh, so LAC I uh, uh, inhibitor. So the LAC I gene encodes for a repressor protein. That repressor protein will act on the operator. Give me one moment while the, while I try and get this back on the screen. There we go. Uh, so the, the encoded protein on the regulatory gene acts on the operon and the site at which it acts is on the operator. And so these, uh, the, the, this repressor protein uh, that is, uh, yes. Yeah, that's a great question. So uh, there are, it is typically, it is classically considered that regulatory elements uh, or regulatory genes typically exist uh, outside of the operon. Uh, in eukaryotes, uh, the, where regulatory genes lie are, typically within our transcription unit, again, uh, eukaryotes don't, have, don't follow this operon model, uh, can be within our transcription unit. Uh, but oftentimes, a lot of times, the ones uh, uh, usually lie outside of the transcription unit and can be upstream or downstream. And that oftentimes is enabled by like how our, just physically how our DNA folds. Uh, but I, I'm starting to scoop myself because we'll get to that. But the uh, in, in this case for uh, in the operon model, typically the regulatory gene does not sit within the operon usually. Yeah. Oh, I'm scoop. Uh, go ahead. So this repressor, this regulatory gene or this repressor protein uh, is part of a, a class that we call repressors. Typically repressors uh, as the name, as the name, uh, as you can glean from the name, they'll bind to the operator and they'll inhibit the operon. Uh, they'll inhibit RNA polymerase from binding to the promoter, or they'll, they'll inhibit RNA polymerase from moving down and transcribing the operon. Yes, Lauren. Yes. And the type of regulatory protein that. Uh, uh, repressors are a regulatory protein that inhibit transcription. They inhibit the operon from being transcribed. And so this is an example of uh, negative control of transcription, whereby this uh, repressor, this, regular, uh, this repressor protein will bind to the operon and uh, inhibit transcription of the operon. Or sorry, it'll bind to the operator, inhibit transcription of the operon. 
So what ends? So this this uh, activity of the of the repressor protein from the LAC I gene, it'll bind to the operator without any. Uh, with, with it'll it'll naturally want to bind to the operator of the lac operon. What's important though is that when there is lactose present, lactose will actually bind and allosterically regulate the repressor protein in such a way where now it it uh, it is now inactive. And so now, in the presence of lactose, this repressor protein is allosterically regulated. It change it's it's bound to lactose. It binds to this other protein. It changes its conformation. And it's now unable to bind to the operator. So now what happens is we, we have lactose in the environment. It binds to the repressor protein. The repressor protein is now inactivated. And now RNA polymerase is permitted now to bind to the promoter and transcribe this entire lac operon, helping the, uh, that encodes for the enzyme beta-galactosidase and for the transporter galactoside permease that now will help shuttle in uh, more lactose and help, uh, uh, help break it down into galactose and glucose. Are there any questions there so far? Yes. So the repressor gene is lac I gene. You can think of it as inhibitor. So this is the regulatory gene. It's not within the operon. Uh, so this gene encodes for the repressor protein, and this repressor protein will typically bind at the operator adjacent to the promoter. Operators, by nature, uh, by, by definition, operators will sit between the promoter and the first structural gene. So that's like a site where even if RNA polymerase II uh, is permitted to bind, it won't go because of the inhibition of that repressor protein. But here now, lactose inhibits, it's inhibiting the inhibitor, for lack of a better phrase. So a negative, a negative and a negative yields a positive outcome. So uh, it's inact inactivating the suppressor, permitting RNA polymerase to transcribe and uh, promote the transcription and subsequent translation of the enzyme and the uh, transporter. Yes, Sahaba? Um, a Hold that thought. So the, the, the way I understood, to make sure I understood your question, after lactose is being metabolized, uh, the byproducts of that, how does that affect the, these genes? Yeah, hold that thought, we'll get to there as well. You guys are asking great questions that we'll get to in just a moment. So this is an example in, uh, in prokaryotes where uh, this is a catabolic pathway where uh, something is broken down uh, and, and to be used as an energy source. So the lac operon helps mediate the metabolism of lactose and glu into glucose and galactose as a substrate for energy. Uh, there are also situations where there are operons that help mediate the uh, uh, anabolic pathways, the taking building blocks to create something. And so one example of an anabolic pathway uh, in this operon model is the, uh, you, the production of tryptophan, where it can be, uh, and tryptophan is amino acid that we, uh, it feels like ages ago probably for some of you, but from the very first lecture. Uh, and so it, in, the abs in, uh, in the absence of tryptophan, uh, there can actually be uh, an anabolic pathway that's triggered. So for that, so we talked about the lac operon for lactose. This is the trip operon for tryptophan. So here, what ends up happening is in the uh, in the presence of tryptophan here. So the, the we're we're going to be focusing. We're going to first look at this from the perspective of the repressor protein on the trip operon. In the presence of tryptophan, uh, the repressor will actually bind to the operator. So in this case, for the trip operon, we have a regulatory, a regulatory gene uh, that is separate from the trip operon. When the trip, when the regulatory gene for the trip operon, uh, when it's, it encodes for a repressor protein that is inactive, 
uh, at steady state. So we talked about how for the lac operon, that regulatory gene that's associated with it for that repressor protein, it's typically active. For TRIP, this uh, repressor protein is inactive. And when it's bound to tryptophan, that will allosterically regulate it to become active. And so this is an example of what we call end product repression. So this TRIP operon encodes for different subunits of a tryptophan enzyme called uh, tryptophan synthetase. As the name implies, it's uh, associated with the synthesis of tryptophan. And so when there is enough tryptophan present within the system, within the cell, this will provide a feedback loop where it'll shut down the synthesizing enzyme that makes up the trip operon. And so this is what we call end product repression. The end product, the ultimate goal for this trip operon is to make tryptophan or to make the enzyme that mediates the synthesis of tryptophan. When there's enough, that will feed back to turn off the, uh, the trip operon. So this is end product uh, repression. Uh, whereas the previous example that we talked about with the lac operon, uh, that is uh, what we typically uh, call that as substrate inhibition. And so this is our substrate induction, sorry. Substrate induction for the lac operon, end product repression for the trip operon. And you can kind of glean what that means from the name where end product here that tryptophan is repressing the trip operon. Brandon, did you have a question? Yeah, um, so just to sort of summarize the two operons, the lac operon is normally off and the trip operon is normally on. Yeah, because in this case, tryptophan is part of, uh, this. it's building up tryptophan to use it as a substrate for, uh, to metabolize for, ener for uh, bioenergy. And so when there is enough, it'll feed back and turn off this, uh, this operon. Whereas for lactose, when they're, uh, and I think this goes back to a question you were asking about glucose. We'll talk about how glucose participates with this. But when, there's, when, there's, uh, when there is an increase in lactose concentration, it'll work to uh, turn off the repressor protein and turn on the lac operon. Are there any other questions? So uh, in summary, we, we kind of just did this a little bit, but to try and summarize it again for, for clarity's sake, the lac operon, the substrate, in that case, it's lactose, it is the effector. It is what's carrying out the function here. The, and it's binding to the repressor uh, that, will, that acts on the operator and allows the lac operon to be transcribed. So that's substrate induction. The substrate is lactose and it's mediating the induction of the lac operon. In the case of tryptophan with the trip operon, that's end product repression, where the ultimate goal, I'm gonna, I'm gonna keep using this because I like the way Liam said this. The ultimate goal of the lack of the trip operon is to make tryptophan and it makes an enzyme that help mediates the synthesis of it. Once there is enough, once that goal has been met, tryptophan will, will feed back and activate the repressor protein and turn off the trip operon, end product repression. Uh, both of these, while they're different, uh, both involve and include negative forms of negative, regu negative regulation. So uh, to get back to the question of if the goal is to use gl uh, lactose as an energy source when there is no glucose, we're, we're metabolizing lactose into glucose. And so is there a feedback whereby uh, glucose can inform the regulation of this lac operon. So as you can imagine, glucose and glucose uh, metabolism, we'll talk about what that looks like in the next unit. But the glucose pathways, uh, the key thing I want you to understand is that they are constitutively expressed or uh, always, for lack of a better phrase, always on or always being expressed because all of our cells are constantly trying to shuttle in and use glucose in an effort to provide ATP, and uh, use that energy source to mediate incredibly important cellular functions. And so this is what's important. If glucose is present, that will turn down other met metabolic pathways like lactose uh, catabolism or this lack, uh, this lack operon like we've been talking about. And the way in which it does that is when glucose is, when glucose concentration is high, the lactose 
actually decrease the concentration of uh, second semester cyclic AMP. So there's uh, upstream from the promoter on the black operon, there's what, what's called the CRP site. CRP stands for the catabolite regulation protein. And so CRP, when it's in a complex with cyclic AMP, creates a transcription factor that helps uh, mediate RNA polymerase to bind to the promoter better and promote transcription. So when there is high glucose levels, there's less cyclic AMP, which means there's less formation of the CRP cyclic AMP complex. Now, when glucose is absent, it'll wanna turn up other pathways like this lactose pathway with the lac operon, which means when glucose concentration is low, cyclic AMP concentration will go up and it'll form the complex with CRP, whereby this complex will serve as a transcription factor that binds to the CRP site. Uh, and this creates this uh, pre-initiation complex now where RNA polymerase will more readily bind to the promoter and mediate transcription. So the way in which glucose, again, the way in which glucose participates here is that glucose is inversely related to cyclic AMP concentration. And cyclic AMP is part of an important complex with CRP that, uh, that's a transcription factor at the CRP site, just upstream from the promoter. So this is an example of positive regulation. So again, if there is glucose and there is no lactose, would y'all expect for the lac operon gene to be transcribed and turned on? Raise your hand if you say no. Raise your hand if you say yes, the lac operon will be turned on. Raise your hand if you don't care. Uh, just wanna get you guys to laugh. All of you guys look so defeated right now. Um, so when there is glucose and there is no lactose, the lac operon will not be on. Because again, when there's high glucose, there's gonna be low cyclic AMP. So there's not gonna be a transcription factor to uh, that tra transcription factor complex will not increase, will not increase transcription of the lac operon. And in addition to that, if there's no lactose, the repressor protein will be inhibiting the lac operon. Now, if there's no glucose, and if there's a ton of lactose, do you expect the lac operon to be turned on, for lack of a better phrase, or to be transcribed? Raise your hand if you say yes. Raise your hand if you say no. Raise your hand if you don't care. You guys are right. Uh, and I would have mentally judged you if you said I don't care. Um, so in the case where there's no glucose, in the case in it, when there is a high concentration of lactose, this will help mediate the formation of that transcription factor to elevate uh, the propensity for RNA polymerase to bind to the promoter and the repressor protein will not be binding to the operator region. So a couple more items before we jump into eukaryotes. Um, so the regions uh, around which the, uh, a region around the promoter where regulatory uh, proteins can bind, those are what we call cis acting elements. Um, they are they are, they are when, we, when we talk about cis, an important, when we talk about elements, that's always at the DNA level. We'll have cis acting, perhaps, uh, as you imagine, there's cis, there's transacting. Uh, those are transacting elements. There's transacting proteins and the proteins that they encode for. So elements usually equates to DNA here. So cis acting elements are, are what act close, situ are closely situated to the promoter uh, and to the operon there. Typically, the regulatory genes, like I described, are not within the operon, they're distant. So an example of the cis acting element is that CRP site that we just talked about on the previous slide, the operator that at, uh, where the uh, repressor proteins act on, they're, they are physically close to the promoter and can help control regulation. And so those are examples of cis acting elements. The regulatory proteins or repressor proteins that come from regulatory genes, those are transacting elements. They are of, on a part of a different operon or a part of a different gene that's controlled by a different promoter. So they are acting, uh, they exist far away from this part of the DNA and uh, these transacting elements will act on trans on a different uh, DNA. So the regulatory gene for the trip and the lac operon is a transacting element because it's on a different uh, transcriptional unit. Uh, 
and it'll come over and act on, uh, typically act on the cis acting element. And so, for example, the again, the regulatory genes and the repressor proteins that uh, that originate or come, they're encoded by them are examples of transacting elements. And so, I want to make sure that this is incredibly clear and not confusing. So, transacting elements encode for transacting proteins. Those transacting proteins might act on typically acting elements. So, for example. The regulatory genes encode for a repressor protein that act on the operator, that cis acting element. But the the what encodes for that transacting element is a or transacting protein or factor is a transacting element. Are there any questions about this? You guys have been asking great questions, so don't hold back. All right. So. We're going to talk about what these uh, cis and transacting elements look like in eukaryotes. And so for, for prokaryotes, we talked about how we looked at how these cis acting elements are really close, by, are typically close by the promoter. For eukaryotes, it's not, uh, it, there's a bit more leniency on what we define as a cis acting element, but the basic principles still apply here. We still have a promoter. We still have a transcription unit. We still have a terminator. We still have uh, an RNA polymerase, in this case, RNA polymerase 2. It's binding to the promoter, and its binding is regulated by how many transcription factors might be uh, binding and creating this pre-initiation complex. So in eukaryotes, the transacting proteins uh, are typically uh, oftentimes going to be transcription factors, and they will bind to cis-acting elements. So the transcription factors they're encoded for maybe on a totally different uh, chromosome, but that transcription factor will recognize and bind to uh, segments of the promoter region that is a, that promoter region or segments of it is a cis acting element. So again, transacting elements are on a totally different segment of the DNA, but the protein that they encode for can oftentimes promote its regulation by acting on the cis acting elements. And so, like I just said uh, a moment ago, the typically the cis the definition or how we characterize cis acting elements in eukaryotes is a little more lenient. Uh, they can oftentimes be thousands of base pairs away from the transcription unit from the gene of interest, uh, but they're still on the same linear piece of DNA. They're still on the same chromosome, still on the same linear piece of DNA, but just could be thousands of base pairs away. But by nature of how our chromosomes are packed in and how our DNA is packed in, uh, it's, it's still physically, it's oftentimes still can physically be close by. And so to help give an example, yes, cool. Um, when you're reading about um, the uh, difference between the eukaryotes and the cis acting elements, Yeah, so typically our DNA, our transcription units, our genes, um, our transcription units are typically one single gene, whereas for prokaryotes, it's typically multiple genes in tandem. So that means that prokaryotes are polycystronic. It means they have poly, uh, like many genes within one transcription unit. We're, we are monocystronic usually. We have one gene encoded for one transcription unit that has a promoter and a terminator. Um, and the operon model is just a way to try and characterize a situation where the genes that are the, these polycystronic genes that are part of one transcription unit can actually work together towards some common goal with some ultimate mission in mind. Uh, so to try and illustrate how different trans, uh, trans transcription factors can act on some of our cis acting elements. So we're going to have a situation here where we have two different stimuli. Uh, we're going to have one stimulus A that uh, we're going to have our gene of interest, our transcription unit of interest here on a totally separate segment of the DNA. Excuse me. Uh, stimulus A is going to act on a totally separate part of the DNA that 
that's the transacting element. That transacting element encodes for a transcription factor that we're going to call transcription factor A. Uh, transcription factor A uh, can bind at both of this first gene to the left and the next gene to the right. And so they're going to participate in the formation of this pre-initiation complex that will help recruit or better recruit RNA polymerase II to the promoter. We have stimulus B. Uh, stimulus B acts on a totally other transacting element that encodes for a totally separate transcription factor that we call transcription factor B. Each transcription factor will recognize certain segments of the DNA that it is inclined to bind to and help participate in recruiting uh, RNA polymerase II to promote transcription. And you can have, multi, you'll have each different transcription factor uh, can bind to different genes that for which it's attributed to. And you can have multiple of that same copy there. And so in this case, we'll have transcription factor B only binding to another sequence here that it recognizes, but it's not gonna bind to that gene over there. So what ends up happening is as you have more, this is a general, this is not absolutely true, but generally true. The more transcription factors you have, you, uh, you increase the likelihood of RNA polymerase II to come in and bind more readily and more quickly to promote transcription. And as, uh, as a result of that, when you compare the degree of transcription or how many transcripts are uh, created at, at these different genes with more transcription factors, you're gonna have more transcripts because it's more readily recruiting RNA polymerase two and, and its participation in creating this pre-initiation complex. Are there any questions here on the control of uh, transcription factors on gene expression? Yes. mRNA transcripts. Yeah, cool. How many transcription factors do you think uh, are affected by the polymerase? On by. Yeah, so that is, I don't know. It's not, uh, it's not typically, you know, typically we have, uh, there's, even though it's depicted as one transcription factor A at each of these promoters, um, you're typically, it's not typically just going to be one. Um, and in addition to that, these are oftentimes existing as dimers or tetramers that can physically wrap around the DNA. And you're, and typically it's probably not just gonna be one dimer or tetramer. And so you might have more than one of transcription factor A and uh, multiple other species of transcription factors. How many, like a precise number, I really don't know. But what we can say is that as a general rule of thumb, as you have more transcription factors per, uh, creating this pre-initiation complex, you're uh, increasing transcription. Are there any other questions? All right. So for cis control elements, again, uh, the, the definition of cis control elements in eukaryotes is a little bit more lenient uh, when compared to prokaryotes. And so because it is oftentimes can be anywhere within the same linear segment of DNA, we need to partition out which ones are closer and which ones are a little further away. And so as a general rule of thumb, uh, here we've written 100 base pairs. You can read a review paper that says, uh, that distinguishes them at 200 base pairs, but it's just uh, a ballpark estimate. Proximal control elements are typically within 100 base pairs, upstream or downstream of the uh, promoter region. Uh, distal control elements are usually more than 100 base pairs away. Uh, and can be upwards of 1,000 to 10,000 base pairs away, but still are able to act on our gene of interest. And the means by which they do that uh, are, and we're gonna, I'm trying to pick this uh, with either an example of an answer that enhances transcription or repressors that repress or inhibit transcription. So up above, we have a segment of the DNA that's far upstream from the core promoter, that's an enhancer. We have these activator proteins that will bind to the enhancer regions of these disc control elements. And again, because our DNA is wrapped and coiled and folds in on itself, these enhancers will come in and help uh, 
with that participation of co-activators help mediate it, mediate the binding of TF2D to the core promoter region, as well as help participate in the recruitment of other transcription factors to the core promoter. So uh, an enhancer is a downstream site that's one to 10,000 base pairs away that by nature of how our, pro our DNA folds upon itself can actually work distally on our gene of interest by either promoting the formation of that pre-initiation complex or inhibiting it. And when it inhibits it, we call that distal control element a repressor. And so this is a illustration from a paper that came out of our, our department where we have uh, two transcription factors of interest uh, depicted at the very bottom in green and yellow and uh, a list of different genes and the green and yellow sites uh, across those different genes are where these transcription factors are capable of binding based on uh, uh, based on bioinformatics as well as experimental uh, testing. And so oftentimes this is uh, defined by a trial and error uh, actually, because while we might be able to try and understand just by sequence alone, what they wanna try and recognize uh, as de depicted in the consensus sequence adjacent to these transcription factors at the bottom, uh, these transcription factors are able to bind all across uh, the segments of the DNA and the like, up into the right arrow uh, that is down the middle of uh, the slide on each gene, that's the promoter, uh, or the, the, that's the, forgive me, the uh, start sequence or the initiation site. And so upstream from that is a promoter. And so you'll see, usually they're, they're binding at the promoter within the promoter region, but they're also binding and being able to, uh, uh, they're also able to bind within the regions downstream from the promoter. And so this goes back to a question earlier about where these regulatory proteins are binding. For some of these transcription factors in eukaryotes are able to bind uh, usually the promoter, but also able to bind downstream where they might actually be working to repress transcription and compete with one another or work in concert to promote transcription. Are there any questions there? Yes. How Uh, that's usually for uh, any, uh, I, I believe it's usually for any pyramidine and usually for the R it's usually any kind of purine. So like, it's not like a specific one nucleotide that needs to be there, but it can be either of that species. All right, so to take all this and apply it to Modi and anabolic stero steroids in four minutes, we're gonna do it. So uh, there are, lots of different mutations that are oftentimes associated or genotypes that are associated with Modi, uh, as well as downstream phenotypes. The one we're gonna focus on the most that as this slide depicts, attributes to 70% of cases is uh, mutations at this HNF protein. So uh, Modi and HNF. So HNF stands for hepatic nuclear factor. And another key player that works in concert with that is uh, DCOH, dimerization cofactor of homeodomains. That's gonna be the one time I'm gonna say the whole name. We're just gonna call it DCOH. And the way this works is that H, uh, HNF is a transcription factor that only binds what's, when it's in a dimer to the DNA. So again, I described earlier how typically transcription factors usually exist, or they usually bind to the DNA in a dimer or tetramer form because uh, they can physically wrap around the DNA. In this case, HNF will only bind as a transcription factor of the DNA when it's in its dimer form. And DCOH is a, a, an adapter or scaffolding protein that helps promote that dimerization uh, that, uh, and helps HNF uh, associate with the transcriptional machinery. So HNF, uh, putting this together, HNF requires DCOH to become a dimer and to help uh, bind and contribute to the pre-initiation complex uh, to promote transcription. So to illustrate it here, uh, DCOH usually exists as a homo tetramer, and we have our HNF monomers, or not monomers, our HNF uh, single, uh, single proteins. And so what ends up happening is that uh, HNF, when present, is able to bind to DCOH, 
and promote the formation of an HNF dimer. And those two together will actually go to and bind to the promoter of the insulin gene and promote the transcription of insulin uh, and subsequent expression of it. There we go. In Modi, the mutations that are present exist at where HNF and DCOH interact with one another. So the mutations that exist within Modi inhibit HNF to bind to DCOH to form that dimer and to become a transcription factor. So because of that, these mutations that a lot, lot of patients in Modi have uh, usually uh, inhibit the expression of insulin. And there's, lot, there's lots of different mutations, but typically mutations that have the greatest uh, phenotype are where HNF and DCOH uh, actually interact, interact with one another. Treatments for Modi, as you can imagine, this is a disease where insulin is not being made. So insulin treatment is the most common, uh, uh, most common treatment for patients that, with this disease. Uh, another treatment are oral hypoglycemics. Uh, they're uh, drugs that help promote uh, the release of insulin during hypoglycemic events. And so sulfonylureas uh, don't promote more insulin expression, but help promote better trafficking and release of insulin. Uh, there are more experimental approaches like pancreatic islet transplants. Uh, the islets are where like the beta cells that are, uh, are dysfunctional exist. And so these beta cells that have this HNF mutation can perhaps be replaced with new islets and new beta cells, or there can sometimes be an entire transplant. Uh, but these are more experimental approaches that are still being investigated. For steroids, let me get this done in one or two minutes if that's okay with all of you. Uh, steroids are, uh, are a class of horm are a class of endocrine hormones that all share a common structure, the steroid nucleus, where we have uh, three six ring carbons and a five uh, a five carbon ring, and so they and they're all based off of a, uh, using cholesterol as its precursor, all based off of cholesterol, and these are all hydrophobic. So what that means is that they can freely pass through a plasma membrane, uh, but if they're super, if they're very hydrophobic, it's hard to envision them being effectively transported through our bloodstream in an aqueous environment. Uh, one of the most abundant proteins in our in our blood plasma is albumin. Albumin serves uh, a few different functions. Uh, it can help stabilize and create appropriate osmotic pressures. It can help with opsonization or uh, quartering off foreign pathogens, and in this case, can also help with the transportation of hydrophobic macromolecules. And so as albumin helps to transport these uh, steroid, steroid hormones, uh, these steroids will, uh, by nature of being hydrophobic, cross the plasma membrane and bind to intracellular receptors, receptors that are within the cells. <clears throat> and some of these steroids uh, that you might recognize can be testosterone is what we'll talk about today, progesterone, uh, and corticosteroids. So when a steroid, when a steroid passes through the cell membrane, what will end up happening is it'll bind to its hormone or steroid receptor. And typically that receptor is in, exists in, in an, either being inhibited by an inhibitor protein or is in, in an active state, inactive state. And when it's bound to the steroid, uh, it's now active. And now that receptor itself becomes a transcription factor will go into the nucleus and uh, mediate transcription of its target gene. So one example of this uh, in, in, for anabolic steroids is uh, oxymethylone, and it binds to the androgen receptor. Uh, androgen receptor typically binds to androgen or testosterone. And so when these synthetic steroids, uh, these synthetic anabolic steroids, when they bind to the androgen receptor, they bind way more strongly. But in addition to that, what ends up happening is that because it's binding more strongly than the natural ligand, natural androgen or testosterone, it's gonna end up creating some downstream effects where it is preventing uh, a feedback mechanism on the receptor. So we talked about the uh, uh, end product, uh, or we, we talked about these feedback loops where 
the gene for which the, that encodes the receptor might be uh, altered or perhaps, uh, perhaps there are downstream modifications that happen post-translationally. With these synthetic steroids, they're preventing these modifications from happening and can, as a result, is always having androgen receptor on constantly. And so that's part of the reason why you'll see people who take steroids the consequences that exist as a response, uh, as a result of that, don't go away because now it's constantly being turned on. And so, what happens next as a result of that? Uh, the genes that androgen receptor, when it becomes a transcription that it binds to, binds to insulin like growth factor one, uh, or we call IGF one. IGF one uh, is a peptide hormone. When it binds to the receptor that it recognizes, it triggers protein biosynthesis and prevents bio uh, degradation of proteins. And so it creates this pro-growth uh, and co constant uh, uh, hypertrophy in muscle mass being created as, as a result of enhanced IGF-1 signaling. Uh, now, as I described before, these, uh, these and, and anabolic steroids have these consequences but can be used clinically. IGF-1 is used therapeutically to help promote uh, tissue growth uh, or overall growth for people who have disabled growth, especially for young kids. And as you can imagine, IGF-1 itself can become a performance enhancing agent. I'm on the very last slide and went out on me. Uh, IGF-1 also contributes to animal size. And so in animals where there's uh, diversity in size like dogs, Great Danes typically have high IGF-1 signaling and Chihuahuas have low IGF-1 signaling. Uh, there's a great group of people that look at transcriptional regulation. This is one, uh, a snapshot of it, but there's even more and I'd be happy to tell you about it afterwards. Thank you for giving me five more minutes of your time. You guys have a good day.